Hello again, everyone, and welcome to our uh, first panel discussion of the day, uh, Vietnam's Wind Energy Development Forum. Um, and we'll be answering uh, one main question, which is, will wind power play a big role in Vietnam's future energy mix? And what are the different policy developments um, and industry trends in Vietnam and also Southeast Asia um, that can position Vietnam as a leader in the region's sustainable energy transition? Um, so our panelists today include William Gaylord from the who is VP Sales of APAC at Vestas. Um, we Cold Wind Asia. Ang Han, who is General Manager of Vietnam for Mainstream Renewable Power, and Logan Knox, who is General Director for Vietnam at UPC. Renewables. Um, moderating this discussion is Mark Hutchinson, who is uh, chair of GWEC Southeast Asia Task Force. Um, so I will pass it off to Mark, but it seems like he is having a connection issue at the moment. Can um, you hear me, Alyssa? Yeah, I can still hear you, but we just can't see you, Mark. So um, okay. I'll. I'll I'll pass it off to you and um, uh, while the video works out and you can uh, introduce the session over over to you Mark. Okay, okay. well thanks Alyssa. Okay, well first of all welcome everybody. I'm, I'm very excited to be here. Um, I think we're all here because Vietnam is definitely one of the hottest uh, wind markets in Southeast Asia. And it's not just because of good wind resources, it's also because I would say you know there's been government support. Uh, MOIT, IREA, and many other uh, government entities see the advantages of wind. They see that wind can get built uh, in a very short time frame, just like solar. And when they compare that to things like LNG fired power, uh, which exposes the country to international oil price volatility, there are quite a few advantages uh, of wind. Um, the domestic capability to support the wind sector are, are growing. And of course, that means jobs important to any government. Um, of course, there are challenges uh, that remain, including you know, exactly what the level of the FIT is and, and GWEC is uh, inputting into that process, helping to provide some guidance on what we think that the FIT should be. Um, also getting projects on, on the, the master plan, but uh, this morning uh, or today, uh, the Prime Minister released a letter and I'm going to ask Fung a little bit later uh, to uh, summarize that because I think that's pretty critical. Um, and I also, I think, you know, we, I think one of the key things that we'll be asking everybody on the call today is we, we want to make sure that we, we have a level of policy continuity to avoid these boom and bust cycles that many markets have seen. Um, so I think in general, you know, where GWEC is very, very positive on the, on the Vietnamese wind market. Um, and so I'm very excited to have the, a very great uh, panel today. Uh, as Alyssa said, we have a good combination of OEMs and developers. So the, the uh, format of today is each panelist will spend two minutes just doing a quick introduction, making some key points. Uh, but as I said, I'll mention, I'll ask Fung to summarize that letter from the Prime Minister. I'll then ask a number of questions to each of them. Um, but I would encourage you uh, in the Q&A, in the chat session, to please enter your questions because we'll get to your questions uh, as soon as possible. So why don't we start? Uh, I will go clockwise from the upper left on my screen, which is uh, Mr. Dong from Goldwind. Can you uh, give us a, just a two minute sort of insight into Goldwind yourself and key issues that you see? I can't hear you. Uh, can you hear me, Mark? Yes, yes, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Mark, for your introduction. And uh, dear everyone, good afternoon. Uh, my name is uh, Dong Nao Dong, and uh, I'm the general manager of Goldwind uh, Asia. Uh, I'm currently in charge of the business development, including service business development of the company in this region. Uh, I feel very uh, honored uh, to have the opportunity joining this panel. Uh, at the outside, please allow me to introduce uh, a little about uh, Goldwind. Uh, Xinjiang Goldwind Science and uh, Technology Company uh, was founded in 1998, and uh, we are actually the witness and the impeller of China wind power industry development. 
uh, and we are committed to become an industry leader of clean energy and also the environmental solutions. Since our uh, foundation, Goldwind has achieved more than 60 gigawatts installed capacity in the global markets, stably operating 35 thousand turbines in six continents, 27 countries. We have nearly 9,000 staff in total. 3,000 of them are R&D and high-level technical experts. And so far, I think Vietnam is in the period of rapid economic growth. There is a great uh, power demand in the future. With the advantage, advantages features of wind energy, cleaner, more stable, and renewable, we have strong faith in our product performance and liabilities in the low wind speed market. And we couldn't wait devoting our wisdom and the technology uh, uh, and devoting our resources to Vietnam to build a clean energy environment in our joint efforts. So thanks, Mark, is my uh, uh, introduction. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Okay. All right, but Logan, can you uh, go next, please? All right, can you hear me, Mark? Yes, okay. thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Logan Knox. I'm the general director at UPC Renewables Vietnam. Um, we UPC Renewables is a privately owned uh, development construction and operations company. So we have been around for about 20 years in over a dozen countries around the world. Um, and we've been focused on Asia since 2006. Um, some of our projects include uh, Indonesia's first wind power project, which went online two years ago. Um, we've developed in China as well as in the Philippines expanding quite a lot into Asia in, in the past few years. Um, in Vietnam, we've been here for since 2017, um, and we started as a small small team, and now we're about 40. Um, and we are just getting started on construction on our first two projects in country, um, and we're trying to uh, assist the country as much as possible under this uh, great you know, uh, wind resource and great framework we've got going uh, to, to try and push wind power in Vietnam. Great. William, can you go next? Yeah, sure. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks, Mark, for uh, the great intro and uh, very excited to be um, in the panel today and lots of uh, things happening at the moment in Vietnam. Um, for those who don't know me yet, I'm the sales vice president at Vestas for Asia Pacific. Uh, we're the leader worldwide in, in the wind industry and sustainable energy solutions. And we're also the leader in Vietnam with 150 megawatt installed and uh, more than 500 megawatt under construction as we speak. Um, we're very excited uh, about the tremendous opportunities uh, that the Vietnamese market uh, is bringing at the moment and, uh, and I hope to uh, be here to support the growth of the Vietnamese market over the long term. Thank you. Great. Uh, Phong? Hi, everyone. Yeah. Uh, great to be here today. Uh, I'm uh, Phong, I'm the uh, general manager of mainstream uh, renewable in Vietnam. Uh, I've been in renewable sector for more than 10 years. And uh, um, in, in Vietnam, uh, mainstream has been working uh, for, since a few years, developing uh, uh, the one of the uh, biggest offshore uh, project in, in the region, uh, 800 megawatt uh, South Chang project. And in our pipeline, we um, have uh, about uh, a few hundred uh, megawatts more in uh, development. And hope, hopefully uh, by 2025, we will be able to put in operation uh, at least one gigawatt of wind project in Vietnam. Uh, this is uh, a big uh, target, but uh, I think it's achievable. And uh, as uh, Mark just shared, uh, I, I'd like to, to share very good news. Um, just a few moments ago, uh, today, the government have uh, signed uh, the approval for seven gigawatt of uh, wind power project to be added into BDP7. Uh, so practically uh, uh, on the project in the list, uh, 1931 by MOIT, uh, will be uh, approved, but uh, uh, we have to have a clear uh, 
uh, interpretation of the letter to see if uh, uh, all of the project will be approved at once or we still need uh, an individual assessment by the MOIT of uh, each project case by case. But anyway, this is very good news for the whole sector. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Fong. Uh, uh, Deepak? First of all, I think uh, to thank GVAC and the other organizations for bringing us all together. There's a lot going on via even live as we are all talking. So good to have uh, the industry all together to talk about uh, how do we take it forward. So I think the uh, announcement is big. Uh, for myself, I'm the regional sales leader for GE onshore wind business in Vietnam and rest of ASEAN. Uh, Vietnam is a key core market for us across industries, across fields. We've seen the journey the country has taken. Uh, it's one of the most promising markets and the speed and the urgency we see, the political support. Uh, I think uh, we are here for long term. Uh, while uh, we all want to put as many as turbines and wind farms uh, within this race, uh, but I think Vietnam has long term potential and I think uh, wind plays a special role, and uh, we look forward to it. Great, okay. Well, thanks everybody for, for your thoughts. Uh, the first question, uh, as I think, uh, I can't remember who alluded to it, but can you please tell us a little bit about how the impact of COVID-19, uh, what it's had uh, on your ability to do business in, in Vietnam? Maybe, again, I'll just start with Mr. Mr. Dong. Uh, I think uh, the COVID-19, you know, has an, a big impact on our business in Vernon. You know, most of our, you know, staff cannot go to Vernon right now because, you know, February actually is the Chinese, Chinese New Year of China. And uh, uh, most of our engineers, they uh, come back. And uh, uh, I think uh, start, starting from the, the, the very beginning of February, the, the, the Vernon lockdown. So uh, most of our, you know, sales uh, cannot go to the Vernon. I think there is a big impact of us to communicate, you know, with our, you know, clients and also our friends in Vernon. And uh, also, you know, we have two projects currently are under construction. And there are also some uh, impacts, you know, because, you know, the, the materials uh, cannot deliver at this moment to Vernon. And also, also in, in those two projects, we are cooperating with, you know, Chinese EPC contractors. And they also need, you know, the labor and the raw materials and also the tools, equipments delivered to, 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 to the Vernon. But currently, the situation is not allowed. So I think there may be have some also, you know, impact of the construction progressing. There maybe we'll have one month delay of our project, but we will see we are struggling or we are working hard to catch up the original progressing. I think, and also, uh, okay, Mark, thank you. It's my, it's my, it's my uh, opinion. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. L L Logan, you're on the ground. You're, you, you're getting things done, right? Uh, yeah, we're trying to make sure that we stay on track. For us and our business, I mean, the, it's obviously had an effect, but um, for those of you who are in Vietnam, you know that the country has actually done surprisingly well. They took it very serious at the beginning, um, and the, the government did a very good job at, at locking things down quickly um, and also uh, preventing a lot of um, people coming from abroad uh, without being quarantined, uh, which I think seemed inconvenient at the beginning. Uh, it's had a very good effect overall, though, because the country has opened back up. Um, I'm sitting in Ho Chi Minh City right now and things are very much back to normal, or not normal, but um, very much back. People are back to work and back in business, except people cannot come and go from the country. And so the biggest uh, problem for us right now is actually just meeting anyone who isn't here. Um, but in terms of getting uh, started with the construction of our projects, they're very much moving forward. Uh, there is very much a concern from our side of how long this will go on, um, because we need people to be able to come into the country to assist us with our projects. And also, um, you know, what what kind of the the what it will look like to open Vietnam back up to the rest of the world. I think a lot of the impact remains to be seen, and we're pretty cautious to make sure, and we're trying to plan to make sure that if there is a re 
uh, kind of a, a second or a third wave of coronavirus in Vietnam that we're prepared for it and try to mitigate the risk. So um, I don't think everything has been seen yet, but certainly on the ground in Vietnam, things are moving forward. William, you said you have megawatts under construction in Vietnam. Tell us, tell us about that and well, the impact. Look, um, I have to say that obviously um, there there is an impact, um, and mainly um, because of some factories who had to shut down. Um, we had, um, I think, two or three weeks of shutdown in the Tianjin factories in China um, post Chinese New Year. Um, but um, the reality is uh, that we learned how to, um, I would say, accommodate with the situation very, very quickly. Uh, our goal um, was to reopen as soon as possible and to ensure business continuity. And the whole company has been geared toward this objective with daily meetings, um, weekly uh, up to the sea level, of course, engagement about COVID management, uh, how to ensure business continuity in the factory, uh, of course, how to ensure business continuity in the construction projects. Um, and uh, and how to ensure business continuity in the projects which have been built and are under maintenance uh, to ensure that the electricity gets to the people who need it. So uh, we've we've had um, a lot of um, of of, uh, of attention uh, to that. And in Vietnam, we haven't stopped construction. Um, we haven't stopped any also maintenance in Asia, uh, as far as I know, um, except in Sri Lanka for maybe a week where there was a curfew but probably the only place where we had to stop uh, anything at all. Um, so all in all, yeah, a lot of work, a lot of stress, um, and, and, uh, and also obviously some impact on the total capacity uh, that we expect to have recovered by the end of the year in terms of, of uh, turbine sales uh, or turbine manufacturing capacity. But, but all in all, we are, um, we are good. And now, um, of course, a second wave, a third wave, or whatever could happen, but I think we have in place all the procedures to accommodate that. Um, in Vietnam, as an example, when we uh, were monitoring a little bit the situation, uh, we decided to uh, take everyone out of Hanoi and Ho Chi Minh and to put them on site or close to the site so they could continue uh, attend to, to the customers and the project construction. Mm. So we didn't have any delay on that. Um, so no, I, I would say obviously uh, stress, but, but all good and, and until now a good success. So thanks to all the team that has made that possible. Great. Okay. Phone, how's it affecting mainstream? Well, in fact, uh, our project are still under development, so uh, not yet uh, in uh, into the construction phase. So for now, we uh, the COVID doesn't impact much uh, the mainstream work in Vietnam. Uh, for the uh, technical studies and engineering work, it's still going mm -hmm. on very well. Yeah. Okay. Great. Uh, Deepak? I think uh, I'll echo what others have said. Uh, I mean, there is impact, and it depends which country, which place you are. Uh, in some places, it's more. In some places, it's less. I would say, even though we have a very strong uh, employee base and labor force out there, but I think uh, we do need to supplement it with experienced uh, technicians and engineers from overseas. So as long as the borders open and uh, travel can start again, uh, I think uh, Vietnam should not see too much disruption. So that's what I think is a key next step, the borders opening up in Vietnam and letting skilled workers move around. Uh, in terms of manufacturing, I think uh, the companies are well diversified and can handle that. Uh, so I think we feel confident. Great. Okay. Um, so what I'm doing is the head of um, GWAC for Asia is is screening the questions so I can pay attention to what's on the panel. Um, she's asked me, maybe we can share a little bit on the, the FIT extension. So, I mean, I can tell you a little bit about what, uh, what GWAC has done with the Southeast Asia Task Force with a lot of people that you see on the panel here. We're, we're feeding into the process, so a lot of the people on, on this call, on this panel, and others are sharing uh, data on costs, timelines, capacity factors, uh, and, and so, you know, return expectations, et cetera. 
to try to help them and uh, really understand from from the from the industry's point of view the the level of the FIT uh, that is I mean, so it would be an extension so it would be for post 20 November 2021 when the current deadline is so it would be mostly you know 2022 and 2023 I don't know anybody does anybody on the call on some of their thoughts about the FIT extension, sort of key concerns, policy continuity, anything like that? I could take uh, a stab at it, Mark. I think uh, okay, sure. FIT extension, I think uh, it's not just a short term uh, interest that everyone has. I think uh, it's required and uh, government is supportive of it. I think a long-term policy, what we have seen in the world, help reduce you, your LCOEs, create more local employment, more local footprint. Mm -hmm. uh, because if you do switch on, switch off every few years, you never get to realize that uh, efficiency gets lost. Therefore, I think even though, uh, you know, we don't expect everything to happen overnight, but I think the way the government is working, if they can figure it out, a 10-year plan, I think that will really uh, motivate not just the uh, OEMs, the developers, the entire ecosystem to really keep bringing in efficiencies year over year. And that's where I think uh, the Vietnam as well as all the participants will benefit. Okay, maybe just to follow on that, Deepak, then I'll, I'll ask the other OEMs as well, is, is the local content issue. You, know, you mentioned it, you know, getting doing more in country helping with jobs which again just makes everybody's lives easier but of course you know there's a balance between very strict requirements for local content can actually increase costs uh, can you comment on that a little bit and then i'll ask some of the you know, maybe i'll ask william and mr dong uh, okay. if they can comment in, on it and then the developers if they have any views on that as well look i think uh vietnam projects can already you know achieve 60 to 70 percent local content uh, there is a, you know, the civil industry, the BOP, they are well-established service providers in that arena. Uh, so really you're talking about the uh, nacelles and plates in a global supply chain. I think, uh, you know, it's very hard to put one in every country, but like I said, mm -hmm. um, can have a roadmap to do consistently one gigawatt a year, 10 gigawatts over 10 years. I don't see why it would uh, stop us from investing more and maybe creating those uh, missing pieces in country. Okay. W William, anything to add to that? Um, no, look, um, on the contrary, I think um, it's, it's not the case on every project because there is a logistic aspect to be considered. Um, but uh, we see that in uh, most of our projects that we are delivering to Vietnam, we're using towers made in Vietnam, uh, which obviously is an important part of the local content and as the fact uh, rightly mentioned, um, there is also um, uh, all the, the balance of plant, uh, electric and civil works, which uh, makes for, for a good portion. Um, there is a lot of knowledge locally on, on, the, um, on, on the transport, uh, on the cranes and installation as well. Uh, there might be a few supply cranes uh, with, with the rush that we are seeing. But all in all, it's generally a local supplier based, uh, which are fully capable. Uh, we see um, we see also some uh, other um, projects and OEMs having a other approach and trying to import everything. Uh, uh, Monopole is coming from China, um, so I don't know the numbers here. Maybe uh, uh, our colleague from Goldwyn can 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 mention a little bit more. But in our case, we can definitely say that we have more local contents than than foreign imported goods for sure. Okay. Um, Mr. Dong, I, I saw you, you you went offline for just a bit. So we're talking about local content. Uh, yeah. A little bit about on Goldwyn's approach to local content. Okay, okay. I think this conference is very hot, you know. I was, <laughs> lots of people inside and <laughs> I was offline. I'm sorry. Yeah, I think for local contents, uh, Goldwyn, we are planning, you know, to uh, developing a localized procurement of power. And we have some products, you know, we are planning to build towers locally in Vernon. And uh, secondly, you know, uh, we, uh, Goldwyn, uh, we pushing forward the construction of a solution factory uh, globally. 
And uh, when, as one of the strategic development plans, we are dedicated to complete uh, the, the, the Vietnam solution fa factory in the following two years. Uh, it's a platform equipped with diversified functions such as, you know, stocking, uh, purchasing locally, repairing, and also remanufacturing of the parts. So at the first stage, I think the solution will be uh, entering on developing the resources of uh, supplying and the storing of materials, including uh, all, uh, purchasing locally of the ordinary grease, consumables, and spares. And uh, also along with the construction of repairing, you know, the damaged parts from the, our uh, service turbines. And with the second stage, maybe we are planning to, you know, to repair the major components of our turbine. So if some uh, generator and uh, uh, nacelle and uh, ha happen some damage, the solution factory will also provide the, the, the reparation services. And in stage three, uh, where, you know, uh, it will be uh, based on the land current business. Our uh, business is growing very fast and we have a certain cap capacity. Uh, we will let the solution, solution factory have the function of assembling our, you know, major components such as generator and um, nacelle. And uh, so it's our planning of the solution factory. And also, you know, we are going, we are uh, opening our uh, local subsidiary in Vernon, Goldman Vernon, and uh, we will use that uh, as the foundation uh, to practice our strategies and uh, business and also prioritizing the current high potential sales opportunities. Uh, I think in the near future, we will create nearly uh, approximately six uh, job opportunities to, uh, to, to Vernon, yeah. So it's, it's my current understanding of the local contents currently based on the current uh, business, yeah. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. So Logan, uh, maybe I mean you're you're doing it. You you have projects under construction. How are you sort of addressing the local content issue? Um, well, so our projects are in the Mekong Delta. Unfortunately, uh, the soil there is pretty soft, um, which means that the actual the the non-term of the project is actually quite high compared to other projects. Um, our towers are going to come from Vietnam on our project. That's one. Uh, number two is that all of the you know the the balance of plant contractors that we'll utilize, which is for the civil works, the foundation, the transmission line, the substation, all of that is is local. We're we're very much in the belief when you're in it a market that you need to get uh, a very kind of local presence. So, for example, we have. Uh, four expats in our company out of 40. Um, so the vast majority of our uh, workforce is, is Vietnamese and most of our contractors are Vietnamese. Um, and so um, the, the projects are very much, um, yeah, have a high amount of local content. Although the turbines, obviously there is no turbine manufacturer that's selling um, actual turbines other than the towers here. So, so um, other than that, most of our uh, equipment comes besides the turbines comes locally um even like the transformers and things uh, for the substation a lot of that can come from vietnam great and and, and Fung, i know you you're you're targeting offshore uh do you have a strategy for how you're going to deal with local content uh in the offshore it's a tough question because i uh uh, I'm not in charge of uh, construction yet, uh, but uh, um, looking at our uh, ongoing uh, 800 megawatt uh, offshore, uh, we have a lot of uh, local subcontractors uh, doing even the engineering works, but also uh, uh, for the installation work, uh, especially for the foundation. Uh, yeah, so okay. uh, I, I, I don't have a figure in mind yet, yet uh, how, how much uh, in terms of uh, uh, percentage compared to the total investment amount, but uh, uh, sure we will be using a lot of uh, local supplies. Yeah. Okay. All right. Let me just check some of the questions. Um, well, I. Well, one of yeah, the questions. I note here some uh, some questions, so maybe I can go directly. If, uh, if you are okay. Okay. Sorry. Which which. I, I mean, I, I, I have noticed uh, some questions here, so I can I can reply directly. Uh, 
for for the questions that I that okay. I can. For example, Liam um, just uh, ask if uh, onshore is uh, more favorable to offshore projects in Vietnam. Uh, uh, so so my answer is that is not not sure because uh, uh, onshore uh, onsite project uh, maybe uh, installation cost and development cost is uh, lower, but. Uh, um, one of the main reason uh, issues with Vietnamese uh, uh, wind projects in general is the on-site uh, resource um, uh, and data acquisition, which is uh, still not enough, and not uh, uh, we don't have uh, uh, enough on-site data uh, for long enough to uh, um, run our financial models and also to uh, optimize our design and also. Uh, it's still not uh, sufficient for uh, the bankability of the project. Uh, so the on-site on uh, data that uh, most of the uh, local develop, the develop uh, local um, project in development right now uh, are um, usually used for the planning planning purposes uh, to be in included into the master plan and to for the pre-feasibility studies only. But uh, I, I think uh, project developers uh, and investors need to wait uh, about uh, one to two more two more years to have more reliable data for their own uh, project um, to uh, optimize the design and uh, to, to get to financing. And uh, uh, also for on-site project, uh, you have the problems of land compensation and also um, some requirement for, from the interna international but also local uh, regulations in terms of uh, setback from the turbine uh, to the urban areas uh, nearby so in vietnam in general uh, you see houses everywhere and uh, if you set back uh, from that uh, according to the uh, to the standards you may uh, uh, finish with uh, a very uh, low capacity uh, uh, compared to what uh, you are approved in in the master plan, so the project might not be uh, in final uh, as interesting as uh, it looks. Yeah. Okay. Um, a couple of questions. So it's a couple of questions have come in on financing. So just to let everybody know, there's a financing session tomorrow. So we'll we'll I think we'll leave those questions for tomorrow's session. Um, some a couple of questions have come in on curtailment and sort of the the ability of the grid to to absorb uh, all the power. I know Logan, maybe you should, maybe you can start, and then I, I'm happy to let anybody else who wants to comment on that. So just to be clear, the question mark is the just to comment on the grid's capacity to absorb. Well, and then uh, there's there was two questions: one on curtailment, and yeah. one on the ability of the grid to absorb. And they're obviously related. So any insights that you could give to both of those, I think, would be interesting. And then I'd be happy to let everybody else, uh, you know, say what's on their minds as well. Sure. So um, there's a lot to say about that subject, but um, essentially, yeah, for those that are not that. familiar, that the 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 power purchase agreement and the interconnection agreement in Vietnam are not exactly the most friendly compared to other countries in in terms of to the the investor, the developer. Um, so uh, basically, if there's a, any kind of uh, problem on the grid, um, we have to agree as a developer to turn down our project and to scale down. Um, and so when we entered the country, we knew that this was the case. Um, the power purchase agreement, um, I think GWEC and others have been advocating to get this um, changed for quite some time in order so that we can get international financing in, which has a much lower cost of capital and we can you know, reduce the price of power rather quickly. That hasn't changed yet. We're still hopeful that in the future it will change, but at the at the current situation is we have to accept that risk. And so our strategy is basically we try and do that very pragmatically. We try and look at the project's fundamentals and do intense grid studies on our projects um, from the very beginning. So where is the power needed? Where can we connect? And we try and stay away from other projects as much as possible, which has some downsides because our projects may have you know less wind than others. But we can address that through just pragmatic, a pragmatic approach of trying to find a place that needs power and that we can interconnect to. What I'd say is that um, for those interested to get into renewables in Vietnam, this is a subject that you really need to find a good uh, consultant in Vietnam that understands the grid very well. Um, 
perhaps people that have worked, you know, with EVM before and are able to, you know, they know the kind of the planning of the substations and how the, the, the master plan of the electricity system will evolve so that if you're planning a new project now, you can project where new substations will be located. Um, and uh, I, I think it's, it's very much a kind of, there's no broad answer. It is that this is a real risk and you need to know where you're connecting your project to and who else is connecting there and try and do as many calculations as you can and, and you know, foresee downside scenarios of just trying to figure it out. Um, but I think one, one point of note is that we have seen EVN and, and the National uh, Dispatch Center take this situation much more seriously in the past one year because of a lot of other issues uh, related to uh, other technologies, renewable technologies. And so uh, I think they're, they're much more paying attention and, and looking at uh, in much more detail than they pr did previously and making sure that the proper upgrading is done to accommodate as quickly as possible, uh, you know, including the fact that projects are coming online so, so quickly. Right. Anybody else want to talk about sort of grid planning curtailment? Nobody yeah, well, you want to talk just, about. Oh. oh, sorry. Yeah, look, just just to add to okay. um, Logan, the, 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 what I see is for me, that is the main issue today um, at, at the time of bringing um, foreign finance. I think uh, we, we all know that the power uh, purchase agreement um, standout is a, or has uh, a few um, a few things that that obviously foreign lenders are looking at very closely. And I think the main one currently is curtailment, especially after what happened in the solar space uh, last year with uh, four, four gigawatt or so built uh, just before the, the end of the feed-in tariff for solar. And, and most of them being curtailed to extremely high level when we're talking 60, 70, 80%. One of our um, wind farm, the Fulak wind farm, which uh, was built three or four years ago, um, sorry, maybe a little bit, three years ago, yeah. Uh, was was fully uh, operational. We had a huge uh, availability. It was great. And suddenly, when those solar uh, were were connected, um, this wind farm was curtailed to uh, thirty percent. And and obviously for uh, um, the owner, it's it's a, well, you can call it call it bad luck, but it's a catastrophe. Because at the end of the month, you still have to pay the, the debt to the banks. You still have to pay your employees and you just don't have the revenues. Um, and and uh, yeah, so it is just not a problem for the lenders. It is also a reality uh, for, for the developers. Um, and, and I think that that's something that um, has, oh, let's put it in a positive way, should be managed better. Uh, in the future, and I hope that now the also not just the industry, but obviously the the, the grid uh, um, operator itself has has learned, and and hopefully with PDP8 coming, etc. Then these are um, uh, things that are going to be taken care of very cautiously. Um, obviously, I'm super happy to hear that this six or seven gigawatt list has been approved by, by the prime minister. But I do hope that there will be um, some order uh, of who can connect and by when to which substation. Otherwise, <laughs> it could be extremely <laughs> dangerous for everyone, you know, just for yeah. everyone. Um, so that's that's my two cents on it. You know, it's not my money. Uh, Logan, uh, I'm sure, is uh, obviously having a, well, a lot more concerns and, 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 and Han as well <laughs> about that. <laughs> I mean, just on that point, William, um, I, I, in, in that list for those master plan, um, you know, proposal to the prime minister from the Ministry of Industry and Trade, they, they do specify exactly what the grid requirements are to get those projects interconnected. So um, some of them, for example, like projects in the Highlands, they need, you know, this Pleiku 2 substation and a lot of very serious substation upgrading. So the question will be, you know, for, for if there is an, a new feed in, feed in tariff, if this gets approved, then what is the framework to enable developers to be able to make that call to go forward? Um, it'd be very difficult for us to make a call to build a project and give, you know, the, the winter manufacturer money to get started when the substation upgrade is not yet completed. 
Um, some developers may take the risk that they see construction getting started to be the upgrade, and then they'll just go ahead and move forward. Um, but I'd say, you know, that's a pretty risky situation. And, and also, depending on your financier, you may not be able to accomplish that. So uh, it, it's, it's encouraging to see that the framework is getting moving um, and that those upgrades are being, you know, noted. But it, it, it is still, there are still a lot of questions that remain of like, how is it all going to work chronologically? Fung, I mean, you're, you're planning some very substantial offshore, which I think will require almost dedicated grid. How are you addressing that? Or am I correct in thinking that for, you need almost dedicated grid for, for, the, for your for offshore? For the containment risk? Or just, just, to, just to evacuate the power? Our, uh, our project will be commissioned uh, in phases. So the first uh, phase uh, we are looking at right now is 200 megawatts, and uh, uh, it's uh, still uh, uh, also to be connected to a 500 kb substation. So uh, for us now, we did the thorough um, grid assessment, and uh, for our, our project alone, we we are quite confident. Yeah. Okay. Uh, anybody else want to comment on the grid or curtailment? Okay, let me go to ask. Um, what, I mean, sorry, switching back to the grid, what about um, the issue of actual grid connection? You know, we, we, we've talked about curtailment, we've talked about grid upgrade, but is there, are there challenges in actually just getting connected and affecting timelines? Um, I, I, I can throw out Mark. That I just say that the, the process of getting an internet interconnection agreement, um, I think is much more difficult than it used to be um, because um, um, because a lot more renewable energy is connected to the grid and there's been a lot more uh, places that have seen cur curtailment issues. And so um, nobody wants to be curtailed, right? I mean, EVN doesn't want power that is that is there being curtailed and the, the developers, the owners don't want it to be curtailed. Um, and so the, the level, and now that there are projects that are being curtailed, um, not so many on wind, but a few, I think everybody, all the stakeholders are just trying to make, uh, trying to get it right and make sure that there's a much lower chance of curtailment. And that's required a lot more inputs from different departments than I'd say there used to be. Um, and so it's just generally slower getting in. Um, which is, you know, not great that it's slower, but good that there is more focus on that problem. Okay. Anybody else? What are... Some okay, so, so, so some questions have come in talking about how much can actually be installed by by November 2021, which is the you know the the FIT deadline. Um, <laughs> I don't know who who wants to who wants to sort of give a projection as to how many of the projects that are currently under construction are going to deadline get delivered. I know that might be a little dangerous for some of you, um, but uh, anybody? Well, in, uh, in, in our own intelligence uh, of the sector, we see that about uh, 900 megawatts of uh, onshore and offshore projects are under construction right now in Vietnam, and hopefully one of them will uh, achieve uh, COD by the end of the 2021. But uh, that's the um, the maximum. Uh, I mean, uh, we can expect uh, 900 uh, megawatt into uh, a wind power to the grid uh, by that time. Yeah. Okay, that, that's your own internal numbers. Uh, well, based on uh, based on uh, uh, intelligence from the market, uh, based on uh, various news about the project uh, that goes into construction, and also news of uh, Vestas, for example, signing some. Uh, uh, EPC agreement, etc. So, yes. yeah. yeah. Okay. Just so I can understand, yeah, on this, that with existing projects, or you mean new projects into construction? Because there's, you know, several hundred megawatts already in operation. Uh, in operation, I think there are about uh, 300 uh, or some, some a little bit more, and uh, uh, about eight to five, uh, nine hundred in construction, according to the news. Yeah. So hopefully, uh, all of them will achieve COD on time. 
So do the OEMs want to comment on this? Deepak, Mr. Dunn? Sure, I think, look, uh, you know, uh, projects who are developing with the intent, I think they will get done. I don't see why. Uh, of course, there's always unknown challenges that could come, but people who have uh, planned it well and uh, know what they're doing, I think it should get done. Uh, and I think one commentator made a good distinction that this is not like solar rush that happened, that overnight, you know, you start putting up panels. It's a bit different. Uh, then it's a bit mm -hmm. challenging and that's what, you know, this forum and others have been lobbying around with the government that it takes a bit more planning and selection. You can't just uh, put turbine uh, behind your house. So I think, uh, you know, that may, that may restrict uh, the ambitious megawatt targets that everybody wants for Vietnam. Uh, but I think uh, people who have put in their effort, I think, uh, should get through. Okay. Mr. Dong, do you yeah. want to comment on that? Yeah, sure. I think I, uh, uh, I agree with uh, Fong's opinion, but I think there will maybe will be more, but uh, because, you know, I think the like, delivery currently, uh, I think is uh, becoming better because you know the, 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 the supply chain is uh, recovering very soon i think at this moment some of the supply chain and also you know i think there are i think the epc uh, resources is currently maybe uh, about about uh, another bottleneck but i think there are also lots of resources from you know uh, china and also i i saw some resources from uh, japan and uh, other countries they want to you know help or support the Vietnam to you know to finish more projects uh, achieve COD uh, in November 2021 next year. So uh, I agree with Hong's opinion. 900 megawatts. Will, I, I I believe uh, those projects will finish a COD. And also I I believe there will be more uh, because you know some of the projects currently you know they are working uh, very hard you know to. To 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 lock uh, to select the turbine and also you know to get approval from uh, uh, MOIT. I think there will be more. Yeah. Okay. Anybody yeah. else? Yeah. Just to uh, jump on what um, Song said, um, I, I think um, if if some OEM still have some turbines available, uh, there might be an opportunity. Um, if this MOIT approval comes in quickly for some projects uh, to be built um, within within the fit-in type deadline, um, obviously um, it, it it really depends also on the risk appetite from the developers because we are clearly entering now the kind of danger zone. If if you really want to be conservative, let's put it that way, or just if you know how <laughs> the risks are on the wind farm. It would take at least a couple of months. You would not target to connect this late, the, the last turbine on, on the 31st of October. You would definitely, you know, plan to try to finish everything by August. And if you look at that, uh, that, that that's that's 14 months ahead now. So um, uh, obviously uh, 14 months, if you look at 30, 50 megawatt project, yeah, you, you can sleep in a few. Uh, yeah, why not? But I, I don't think it's going to be another gigawatt built, you know, uh, even if, I'm sure Goldwyn has plenty of turbines to sell. Uh, <laughs> I, I think it will still be a reasonable amount of uh, on top of what could or has been already uh, announced and 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 the construction because there is a, yeah a physical limit to what can be done. Um, and and yes, uh, it's not like solar panel. Uh, there are things that can be done to accelerate, uh, like putting more cranes, putting more staff, putting more this and more that. You can double, triple the teams, but that has a serious impact on the cost of your project. And then also you have uh, what is what is what makes sense um, for the project. Is it still profitable to go ahead if you need to pack all those extra costs just to reach that deadline? So, but uh, but definitely, I uh, look. I wish for the best for everyone and and for the maximum of of megawatts to be built in that country because that's what the country needs. So, uh, and um, yeah, I'm I'm super happy um, that that uh, there, there there would be. Uh, at, yeah, I hope it's going to be 900 or more um, because that's the kind of signal we need to show uh, 
and, and I'm sure that it's also going to be a success story for Vietnam and, and the Vietnamese government and Vietnamese authorities to uh, to also um, show the rest of Asia what can be done. Uh, so no, extremely extremely positive about the outcome. Um, and and again, not not really concerned that um, those. Uh, projects would be commissioned by by November 21, unless uh, and touch wood uh, there would be a second pandemic or whatever. Uh, and of course, this is the kind of thing that needs to be uh, uh, taken into uh, consideration and, and managed very carefully. Okay, so it, we're getting near time. Uh, there's one question that came in from Essa that says. Interesting, and he's with Poiri. So, uh, Essa, we've been in discussion with developers for roughly 2.5 gigawatts, all planning for COD before FIT deadline. And he says, I'm quite sure we're not aware of all the projects. Okay, so uh, 2.5 versus 900, who, who wants to talk about that? Well, uh, I'd like to uh, compliment Sir William's uh, comments here. Um, when we talk about project development, it's not only about uh, permitting and uh, uh, placing turbine orders. You have to do many things else, uh, right? And especially where, if you look at uh, international financing, you have to uh, to um, uh, respect a lot of uh, uh, standards in uh, project development, and uh, in particular, the IFC standards the equator principles and also uh, the one bank uh, guidelines for health and safety and if you uh, if you do own those um, if you follow on those standards uh, properly it will take a lot more time than uh, two years to develop a project properly so uh, yeah um uh, for for smaller the project uh, like 50 megawatt or less than 100 megawatt that you can uh, finance locally uh, uh, I think uh, achieving COD by 2021 would be still possible, but for a bigger project uh, and uh, with uh, international financing, I don't think it is possible. Anybody else want to comment? I think there will be, uh, so there is a gap, 900.25 gigawatts. Uh, but uh, in my opinion, I think uh, there will be uh, more need to be uh, installed. I will be uh, installed uh, next year. And, uh, you know, because uh, uh, I think at this current stage, if uh, just like William, you, you know, uh, we, we need to support the government's government's variable, and we also, you know, to uh, achieve uh, more COD projects next year, I think at this moment, uh, our OEM, Deepak and William and also Golden should work closely with our developers here in Vietnam because the, the developers need to approve very fast and also you know our ODM should prepare all uh, the, 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 the production also for those products in a very early stage because you know as the time going I think it's already June of 2020 and if the projects need to be finished COD and next year in November, I think uh, there are not uh, a, a big time for, for us, you know, to prepare the turbine. So I think uh, at this moment, if we want to make everything go fast and achieve more installation, we should work together and closely. So I think the, the ultimate limited resources of the installation and also, you know, EPC contract uh, work, uh, I think uh, actually, uh, uh, China, you know, has some, you know, uh, uh, EPC uh, companies and uh, they can, you know, provide resources to Vietnam and to help us, you know, to to um, uh, make the EPC uh, work. And I think that will also help us to install more. So it's my uh, opinion. Uh, if we want to uh, achieve more, we need uh, much more closely collaboration at least more. Okay. All right. So we're right at the end. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask one question. And, and it's three years from now, and we're looking back at how many gigawatts or megawatts of wind were installed in 2022 and 2023. So uh, I'll, I'll start with I'll start with Logan. And please tell me how, how many megawatts in 2022-2023, assuming that the FIT extension gets solved and it's a reasonable one within the next few months. Including 2021 or just 2022 and 2022? No, no, no. no. 
how's, how's, how's 2021? You know, let's, let's put aside all of the all of the discussion we just You're had really on making C. Giving me a stretch here. It's it's rolling the dice, Mark. But um, I would say two gigawatts, two and a half. Okay, D pack, two and a half D pack. Yeah, I think I would agree to that range between two to three. Okay, that's that's good. Phone. Yeah, I would uh, vote for two to two point five, maximum. Okay, William, be an outlier. I'll go closer to three. <laughs> okay, Mr. Mr. Dong. Yeah, I think three to four. Wow. Okay. Yeah. So, Mr. Dong, you're, you're the you're the true optimist here. <laughs> Mark, okay. we didn't hear your number. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I think I'm good with. Uh, Actually, no, I think it would be, you know, given what's happening, I, I think I'd probably go with Mr. Dung, three plus. I oh, think, I, again, I'll just talk, you know, let's think about it. Where else, why are we all here? Why are you here? Because the opportunity in Vietnam between the resource, the support of the government, whatever it is, it just fits the situation, right? Um, and so we're all going to be putting lots of lots of effort into this market over the next couple of years, and I think uh, things will happen. So, uh, yeah, great. Thanks, everybody. I really appreciate your uh, your time, your insight, everybody on the call for for your questions. And uh, I'll hand over to to Alyssa. Thanks so much, Mark. And thank you again to all our panelists. That was a super interesting discussion. Um, and just to let everyone know that uh, we will be following up with the recording of this discussion if you want to re-listen to everything again. Um, so now we'll break. We have a little networking break right now. So we've just opened the virtual expo and the networking area. So we would encourage you guys to check out uh, those features, meet a bunch of industry leaders and reps in the virtual expo, as well as relevant other attendees um, to kind of broaden your network and meet other people, professionals interested in Vietnam's uh, wind market. So, um, I would, so I'd encourage you guys to head over there now. You can also just message people directly by searching for them in the people's tab on the right hand side of your screen. Um, so we'll take a half hour break um, for you guys to, to get your networking on and then we'll meet back in the sessions area in 30 minutes for the business matchmaking session where we'll hear from local Vietnamese developers on their uh, wind uh, power project portfolios. Um, so in, happy networking and we'll see you back in 30 minutes. Okay. Thanks, guys. Cheers. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Very Thanks, much. everyone. Thank you. Yeah. Everyone. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks. 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 So I, I'll be in the mainstream uh, booth if anyone seems interested. Yeah. <laughs> I will go see your booth. Oh, yeah. Bye bye.